Ambassador Vasily Nabenza at UN headquarters in New York. Welcome to Hard Talk. Good afternoon, London time, Mr. Sacker. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, Ambassador. Let me ask you this. After more than 100 days, would you say that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is going to plan? Well, I think it is progressing. Nobody, nobody uh, promised uh, to deliver it in three or seven days, as, uh, uh, as some uh, pundits uh, are, uh, are saying now, uh, that uh, the Russian, the Russian uh, special military operation uh, stalled uh, and is not progressing at the pace uh, that was uh, initially envisaged. But the progress is being made, that's clear. Uh, one of the reasons of the so-called slow pace is that we are not targeting uh, we are not targeting uh, civilian civilian uh, infrastructure and areas uh, deliberately. We're only hitting military targets, and it takes time. We are not doing doing capex bombing or anything else uh, like that. Uh, but the progress is there. That's for sure. Ambassador, I have to say, you're the most senior Russian official whom I have heard say uh, that the initial operation stalled, that the operation is going slow. Is that your recognition that the initial plan to seize Kiev and to install a new pro-Moscow government, that entirely failed? I'm not aware of these plans. Uh, and the, the progress that you are, or the lack of progress that you're referring to, is it's in the eye of the beholder. And I think that, uh, I think that according to what uh, our military are saying, the, the plan is developing according to the military plans that were initially envisaged. Of course, with minor tactical changes, because uh, you cannot uh, predict whatever uh, happens on the front line, but, uh, but the, plan, the plan is moving. I don't think that anybody uh, in the Russian uh, leadership was ever announcing the plans uh, to, uh, to uh, take Kiev and install uh, uh, what you call a puppet government there. Why can't you level with the Russian people about the scale of Russia's military losses? Uh, what do you mean I can't level it with the Russian people? Well, I don't mean you personally, but I mean the Russian government as a whole. They haven't issued any official figure for the number of Russian soldiers killed since the middle of March, when the figure was something over 1,300 men. Neither, neither have uh, the Ukrainian side, uh, has the Ukrainian side, and it, it's, uh, it's customary in the time uh, of a conflict uh, to, uh, to not to disclose military, military losses, and of course the uh, Ukrainian side is trying to portray it um, uh, as uh, heavy losses by the Russian side, try to, try to exaggerate them and to, de to, de to diminish their own. And for a long time they were able to hide uh, from the West and from the, their own public uh, heavy losses that the Ukrainian side, side is suffering. Uh, recently, uh, Zelensky uh, admitted that the losses are heavy and the situation uh, in Donbass well, that, is that, 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 That's the point, Ambassador. President Zelensky very recently said that the Ukrainians are losing up to 100 men a day in the very brutal fight in and around Severodonetsk and in the Donbass. You, according to the Ukrainian figures, have lost 30,000 or more personnel in this war. We can't verify that figure. The US, using all of its different intelligence sources, believe you have lost more than 15,000 men. And I don't need to remind you that in the entire decade of your war in Afghanistan, you lost just under 15,000 men. So I put it to you, the scale of your losses in the last 100 days has been staggering and would shock the Russian people if they knew. Uh, neither can I verify those figures. Uh, as I said, they're not being disclosed. And there is a clear trend during the time of the conflict to ex exaggerate the, the opponent's, uh, upon, opponent's losses. So uh, I cannot, I cannot uh, tell you the, the numbers uh, and I cannot uh, verify what the Ukrainians or the U.S. is saying about it. You, you talk of military progress. It is clear that after more than 100 days, your forces are essentially locked in a stalemate war of attrition in the Donbass. You haven't yet taken Severodonetsk. You're unable, it seems, to take the whole of Luhansk, let alone the whole of Donbass. And if that represents progress, I'm just wondering what the plan is. 
uh, give it the time, you will see, you will see, uh, uh, you will see uh, the the liberation of uh, all the Donetsk and Lugansk oblasts. Uh, uh, that uh, that will uh, hopefully take place soon. Uh, the, you you asked me uh, what what the plan is. Uh, the plan was uh, the initial plan. The aims of the operation were announced uh, were announced publicly. That was uh, uh, neutrality of Ukraine, demilitarization, and denazification of the country, uh, and the liberation of Donbas was Donbas was uh, was the primary goal, which is being implemented at the moment. Is Russia going to stop using conscripts in this war? Vladimir Putin promised back in March that it wasn't happening. A day later, the Russian Defence Ministry admitted it was happening. And the BBC just last month spoke to a mother of two young sons, both of them conscripts, who ended up fighting in Ukraine. Is that going to stop or not? Uh, there were reports uh, in the beginning of the conflict of the special military operation that indeed, uh, indeed, there were a, a few concrete conscripts uh, that were in the army, not, not uh, the, uh, the the people uh, who served there on contracts, and that was uh, immediately rectified. I do know, do not know about any new cases of con conscripts being being sent uh, sent to Ukraine. Uh, but I know that uh, Zelensky uh, announced, declared the, the complete and total mobilization of the country, and I know that he's sending young boys, uh, young boys without any military experience to the front line. Mm. It seems uh, a month or two ago, you and other senior Russian diplomats were very keen to tell the United States and Europe not to send heavy weaponry to Ukraine. In the words of Sergei Lavrov, if they did so, there would be very serious consequences. And he said, indeed, it might raise the possibility of escalation to the point of nuclear confrontation. Those heavy weapons are now being sent, including multiple rocket launch systems from the United States and from the UK, even heavy artillery now being sent by the German government. It is happening. So where are these consequences? Uh, I read uh, a quotation uh, recently of one uh, of uh, an assistant defense secretary of the U.S. who said that the U.S. does not want to escalate the conflict, but uh, Russia has no, uh, no say in what the uh, U.S. can or cannot uh, supply to Ukraine. I, I would agree with the, with the latter part of the sentence, but he should have dropped the, the, the former one then. Uh, because this is a clear escalation of the conflict. Uh, we, we said that uh, uh, if uh, these weapons, and they are already supplied, are being continued to be supplied, then uh, we, we, it, will, it will make us uh, to adopt a decision to move uh, Ukrainian forces as far uh, from where they cannot uh, reach the territory either of Russia or of Donbass. So this is a clear escalation. We know that uh, these weapons, these arms that are being supplied to Ukraine are being used now uh, in shelling Donbass, residential areas with no military, with no military uh, objects uh, there. Uh, so, you know, th this only testifies this is not a war with Ukraine. Ukraine is just a, poor, a pawn in a bigger geopolitical game. This is a proxy war of the West with Russia. But when you talk of severe consequences and escalation, you're bluffing, Mr. Ambassador, aren't you? Because what we see on the ground is a Russian military force in Ukraine that is struggling to take any new territory at all. So these threats of yours, they're empty. Let's compare notes uh, about it in about, a week, in about a week or two, and we'll see and we'll see how much we are struggling there and what progress uh, would be achieved by then. International law is at the very centre of, of what you do day on day inside the United Nations. How does it feel to be the representative of a country that is judged by the international community to be conducting an illegal war? Who is uh, who are you calling the international community? European Union and US? Uh, or perhaps, well, no, I'm, I'm looking at the International Court of Justice, the UN body, which has ordered Russia to end the invasion of Ukraine. Well, the West today is in a clear fit, uh, fit uh, of delirium uh, over the, what is happening in Ukraine. It, it does not, uh, it does not analyze what led to the situation that we are witnessing now uh, and the decision by the uh, by the international court of justice on temporary measures 
was clearly uh, was definitely uh, uh, decided by political considerations, not by the by the uh, right. So, so you merits, dismiss you dismiss multilateral institutions like the International Court of Justice as as biased against you. I I, I just wonder whether it makes any difference to you when, for example, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who is actually Chilean, Michelle Bachelet, she's not from the West, as you would call it, she uh, has issued a statement saying Russian armed forces have indiscriminately shelled and bombed populated areas, killing civilians, wrecking hospitals and schools and other civilian infrastructure, actions which she says may amount to war crimes. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, a lot of reports on the alleged Russian atrocities in Ukraine, uh, which are not uh, which are not verified, they cannot be independently verified. But nobody, uh, or very rarely, you speak about about atrocities uh, that the Ukrainian uh, armed forces and nationalist battalion are, uh, are making in Ukraine. Well, with respect, uh, Ambassador, I, I, you, you probably know that I, I interview Ukrainian officials and I challenge them rigorously. I'm here today to challenge you rigorously. And you and say they said, that they these, said, they these said as you put it, accusations and allegations cannot be verified. In fact, they have been verified. The UN, which has people on the ground, says hundreds of children have already been killed inside Ukraine. Save the Children, an independent NGO, says more than 1,800 Ukrainian schools have been damaged and destroyed. We know factually that nearly 400 Ukrainian healthcare facilities have been damaged or destroyed by shells and bombs. These are not accusations and allegations, Ambassador. These are facts which are the, core, the direct result of Russia's military operation in Ukraine. Now, I have, a, I have a question to you, perhaps a rhetoric one. You don't have a, a single doubt that this is not being done by Russian forces only. You do not, do not assume that that could have been done by the Ukrainian forces, who, are, uh, who from day one uh, deployed, deployed their units, including heavy uh, armor and artillery, around uh, residential areas and communal buildings, like schools, kindergartens, uh, medical facilities. They continue to do it now in Nikolaev, Kramatorsk, Slavyansk, and Odessa. They shell their own uh, their own uh, residential areas, and to that there are evidence and testimony from the prisoners of war from the Ukrainian yeah, army. You, that came you, from you, you've stuff. been saying for many weeks now, Ambassador, that the uh, devastation of cities like Mariupol is the result of Ukraine shelling its own people and its own buildings and its own cities. I will leave our audience to judge for themselves whether that claim has any credibility. I just wonder whether you believe that the Ukrainians are raping their own women and children as well, because the UN has now catalogued at least a dozen cases where Russian forces and their associates have committed egregious sexual crimes against Ukrainian civilians. Uh, first, uh, on uh, residential areas in Mariupol, what uh, Ukrainian uh, armed forces and nationalist battalions uh, were doing, and that's, uh, that's their uh, habitual tactics. They they send people to the basements, uh, uh, residents of those areas. They take their apartments and turn them into firing positions from, they, they, from where they fire from the, to the, at the Russian troops, uh, and, and calling for the for the uh, for the return fire. Uh, now on the on the uh, sexual violence, we just had a meeting uh, on Monday, on the 6th of June. Uh, on uh, Ukraine and sexual violence and conflict and trafficking in persons. Uh, and that was uh, a peculiar meeting because no one who spoke, not a single delegation, uh, as well as the chair of the European uh, uh, Council, Charles Michel, who, who came uh, specifically to attend that meeting, could cite a single proof or example uh, of uh, sexual violence committed by the Russian, Russian army. Uh, we were the only ones who, 
who mm. cited and quoted and, and uh, gave an example, an example of those sexual uh, crimes that the Ukrainian forces have committed. I could repeat it today if, uh, if you are eager to hear. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, then it, I, it, I, you know, you, I, you, I, I, can, I, I can put, I can put uh, I, the, the facts on the ground as reported by independent UN investigators to you. You can deny them and say they're fake and say that the UN is biased. We could spend the rest of the interview doing that. I just would like to make a slightly different point, which is one about truth-telling, truth-telling and credibility, Ambassador. We know that you have said untruths, even at the UN. You held up, for example, uh, pictures of women after the attack on the maternity hospital in Mariupol. You claimed that the two pictures you had were of the same woman and that she was a fake, she was an actress. It wasn't true. Investigations showed that these were two different women. One of them died after the attack. The other was actually sent in the end by Russian forces to Donbass. So what you did was entirely untrue. You also claimed that you had evidence of leaks showing uh, a bioweapons facility in Ukraine. Even one of Russia's respected uh, scientists said that the evidence you presented was absurd, nonsensical and absurd. So you don't tell the truth, Ambassador. First, we have to finish on uh, on sexual violence. You said that we didn't we didn't cite a single uh, a single uh, uh, example. We did. First no, of I, all. I didn't but say I, that I at all. Refer... I never said I never said you didn't cite an example of, of sexual violence. Right. I said Let we me... could trade we could trade discussion on these particular accusations all day. I just wanted to put to you cases where you have been exposed for simply I uh, put it bluntly not telling the truth. Before I am exposed, as you say, let me finish with the sexual violence. Uh, one of the briefers at the Security Council was uh, was uh, the representative of the Secretary General on sexual sexual violence in conflict, uh, uh, Camilla Patton, uh, who said that uh, that she had reports, uh, obviously from the Ukrainian side, on 124 cases of alleged sexual violence committed by the by 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 the Russian troops, which were not. Uh, verified and cannot be verified at the moment. Uh, that's point one. Secondly, do you know the story of the Ukrainian Ombudsman Lyudmila Denisova, who was fired by the Ukrainian parliament because the lies that she was uh, spreading, yeah. uh, spreading, uh, Ambassador, stressing you, specifically I think you've made your point that you don't accept, you don't accept the veracity no. of the allegations about sexual violence. We're going to have to move the interview on or else we're going to run out of time to get through no, some no, very no, important no, matters. No, no. You asked so, me about the case. I want to finish what I'm saying. She was fired because she was spreading lies, which was recognized by the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, it was more than enough even for them. And no, as recent as yesterday, she gave an interview where she said, when she spoke in the Italian, with the Italians on that issue, she said she, she, did over, she overdid her job because she wanted to attract attention to Ukraine, uh, thus confirming that she was lying. And that's it. Well, we're going to move on. Why have hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian civilians from occupied areas, now occupied by Russian forces, why have they been sent to filtration camps, then either into the previously occupied parts of the Donbass or into Russia itself? Why is that happening, including hundreds of thousands of children? Uh, they, hundreds of thousands of children. They, they are not being forcefully, uh, forcibly sent uh, to Russia. They're, that's the choice of their, uh, of their own. When, when the people wanted to be evacuated from areas of fighting, we provided humanitarian corridors, and we never, uh, we never, uh, we never told those people which way to go, way west to east, and they chose that freely. Those people who are in Russia today, uh, which amounts to 1.6 million people, roughly. Uh, they, they made their free choice. They were, not, uh, they were not forced to move to Russia. How did you feel when your diplomatic colleague, a counselor at the UN for Russia in Geneva, Boris Bondarev, when he said, as he quit his post, he said, never have I been so ashamed of my country. It's all about, he said, the job, but being a diplomat for Russia right now is all about warmongering, lies and hatred. When you see your country doing the worst things, it must be your decision to terminate your connection with that government. We all have to take responsibility. Are you prepared are, to take are, responsibility? Are you, are, you calling me, are you calling on me uh, to do the same thing? I'm just wondering, I'm wondering whether that struck a chord with you, Ambassador. 
uh, uh, well, we are a free country and every person has the right to express uh, his, uh, uh, his position on the one or the other issue. Uh, uh, if I am ashamed of something, is I am ashamed of the Kiev authorities for, for eight years lied to the world about what's happening in Ukraine, uh, about what's happening in Donbas, and the free world was happily buying that lies from, uh, from the Ukrainian regime. Uh, if I regret about something, I do regret that the Kyiv authorities have not opted to faithfully fulfill Minsk agreements, which would be a minor, minor evil for them compared to what they're experiencing now. I wonder whether the bankrupt Ukrainian regime is not biting their elbows, that they have not implemented what could have prevented what is, uh, what is happening today. Did, did you also regret the fact, as a senior Russian diplomat, that the international community now sees Russia using uh, food to quote the president of the EU Council, Charles Michel, at the UN, using food as, quote, a stealth weapon? by refusing to export much of your grain into the world market and by certainly uh, stopping and thwarting Ukraine's efforts to export its grain supplies, millions and millions of tons of wheat. We are not refusing to export our grain to the world market, but there are obstacles that should be overcome uh, to do it. Uh, indeed, grain and fertilizers are not under sanctions, but no, the Russian not. vessels, their insurance, uh, the uh, the financing finance operations uh, to pay for that grain are so first before we export anything those things have to be lifted uh, and the arrangements made uh, then on the Ukrainian grain uh, we said uh, we said long time that uh, uh, that uh, it is not our fault that the uh, coastal waters near Odessa and other ports in the south of Ukraine were mined by the Ukrainians. Uh, if they do demand it, and if we are ready to provide safe passage for their vessels to go and to export their grain. As, as recent as today, uh, uh, Minister Lavrov, who was in Turkey uh, for, the, for the talks with, uh, with the Turkish officials, in particular on that issue, said that we are ready to, uh, to lift whatever obstacles for the export of Ukrainian grain right. and that we will not use it as a means... Uh, Final, to, to, yeah, sorry to interrupt, Ambassador, but we're, we're, we're almost uh, out of time. Sorry to interrupt. We're almost out of time. An important final question for you as the UN and Ambassador for Russia. Do you worry about Russia's diplomatic isolation and economic isolation right now? If we look at what has happened, you only have the active support for your military invasion of Ukraine from Belarus, North Korea, Syria and Eritrea, four dictatorships. Even China, which is supposed to be your friend, says that Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty must be respected. You're out of friends. I uh, do not think the assessment is right. I. Uh... I'm not sure that uh, your attempts to isolate Russia succeeded. Uh, I think that uh, the West uh, perhaps uh, made some tactical gains, but uh, it is losing strategically. Uh, one thing that is a clear uh, outcome of those right. uh, sanctions uh, uh, that, uh, that the West introduced is that you lost uh, practically any leverage uh, uh, on Russia um, at all. Uh, all you know right. that President Putin, even before even before uh, this conflict, he was saying, he said once, that uh, let them in the West introduce, introduce uh, all the sanctions they can. Uh, we had no illusions before and we will not have any illusions right. then. So. Uh, sorry, Ambassador, we have to end there. I thank you very much for joining me from New York. It went too fast. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't make uh, many points that I wanted to. Well, <laughs> we appreciate your time. Thank you.